as I was reading through the Gospels, I've noticed that there's a lot of people who seem like they should have known Jesus for who he was, and they missed it. And the Bible says they had blinded eyes. But do you know why people are so skeptical? It's because there's a lot of things to be skeptical about. And I don't know if you've gotten a call like this, but I got a call here this last week that went something like this. So if you want to know about this case, just press one thank you. Here's where it starts. This call is from the Department of Social Security Administration. The reason you have received this phone call from our department is to inform you that we just suspend your social security number because we found some suspicious activity. So if you want to know about this case, just press one thank you. How many of you have gotten a call like that? Yeah, there's been a lot of them going on. And you know the sad part is that they had on the news a lady from Eugene who went from the robocall to pressing that number, and then she got a real person. And they told her in graphic detail that her number had been used in the commission of a crime, and therefore the government was going to seize all of her assets, and she needed to get her money out of the bank right now. And you can understand how that would kind of get your ticker going, right? That's kind of concerning, and your Social Security, and your retirement, and all this stuff. But you hope that somewhere along the line she would have opened her eyes when he told her to stay on the phone, when she went to her bank, when she took money out of her savings account, and then she went to a machine and she invested it in Bitcoin in an account she'd never heard of. Somewhere along there, you think she would have gone, wait a minute here, there's something wrong with this. But you know why there's skepticism? Because there are so many people that are liars and manipulators and cheats, and there are so many people that are saying what they're not. In fact, you know, realize there's seven people today who have their own cult around the world claiming to either be Jesus Christ or to be Jesus Christ reincarnated. And they've gained a following, and there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people that are following them. Why, why do they need to be careful? Because, you know, as you go through life, you realize that there's a lot of people out there trying to steal, kill, destroy, trying to take from you. And so we develop a skepticism. And I want to talk about what happened at the Easter story. And I want you to hear it's not only dangerous to believe what isn't true, it's equally dangerous to not believe what is true. Sometimes we're more wary of believing the things that are not true. We're not as wary of not believing what is true and responding appropriately. So last Sunday here at this campus, we talked about the story of Lazarus, and it reminded me that seeing is not believing. I think there's a sign of a, a feeling around people that I've talked to that are wrestling with their faith in Christ that I wish I could have been in the first century. I wish I could have seen Jesus in the flesh. I wish I could have seen some miracles. I would love to have been there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But I find as I read closely that what happened in the first century is pretty close to what happens now. That every time Jesus showed himself to be God, there was a split decision. And I think of this story, if, if you can take yourself for a moment to, at the Sutherland campus, we looked at Lazarus last week, and, and you get to this incredible moment where Jesus is standing in front of an open tomb where Lazarus has been four days dead. And he uses his dad voice, as Pastor Jeremy said, Lazarus, come out. Can you imagine standing there, looking at this black hole, and then hearing movement inside of it? A little freaky? And watching somebody come out, and they're all bound up in all these claws like a mummy? Would that rearrange your theology? Yeah. And, and Pastor Jeremy brought out a really good point after he said it. The verse after that says, and some believed. Wait a minute. You went to a funeral. You were in mourning for four days. This guy was dead, dead. And you just watched him come back alive. And it says, some believed, and some went and tattled to the to chief priests and the Pharisees. You know what this Jesus is doing now. It's not the amount of information you have that creates belief. The people that should have known the most not only didn't choose to believe, they chose 
to be anti-Christ, anti-Jesus. So you look at the Jewish leaders, and they saw incredible miracles. They, some of them were there watching Lazarus walk out of the tomb. These were guys who had memorized huge portions of Scripture. They understood the prophecies leading to the Messiah. This was the same group that told Herod, if you want to find him, go to Bethlehem. That's where the book says he's going to be when he was born. So they had all the information. They heard Jesus teach. In fact, they went to him and they tried to trip him up and mess him up and, and get him in trouble. And every time he answered supernaturally, wisely, incredibly. And you'd think if there was any group that should have been lined up to say, we want to follow Jesus, it would have been that group. And they became, in fact, the chief opposition. And there were so many evidences of God at work. They saw miracles. And, and what happened then is it says, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees realized this has become not just an itinerant rabbi up in the Galilee. This is now a popular figure who's getting credibility with the masses in Jerusalem. And this is a movement that's rising. And now he did this rising of the dead of Lazarus. And what are we going to do? This is getting out of our control. And it scared him. But this set up Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is what we are celebrating this weekend and the Green Campus actually walked through it last weekend in their service. They actually had a horse in the service. We've never done that here, but I guess everything was okay. But they were memorializing that time when Jesus came as the king. You know, he was on a colt, which was in answer to the prophecy from Zechariah. He rode into the city People held palm branches and laid them in front of him. They took off their cloaks and put it in front of him, and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, which is a quote from the Old Testament. You see, they thought he was the king, but they thought he was the king in the story that they were telling in their own head. I mean, you think about it. What kind of king would it be if he could take five loaves and two fishes and feed thousands of people? if he could calm the storms, if he could raise people from the dead, that's a pretty handy thing to have in a king. And in their minds, he was going to come in and kick out these awful Romans and restore Israel to the former glory that they'd had when King David and King Solomon were there. And they were going to be the center of the earth again. You see, it wasn't so much about Jesus, it was about them. And they went along with the crowd and they sang. And Jesus when the Pharisees came and said, can't you shut these people up? Can't you stop this? He said, if they were to be silent, what? The very rocks would cry out. I am at this moment and this is what's appropriate for now. But you know, he soon started talking right after that event. He started talking about dying. He had predicted his death many, many times, but in Romans, or excuse me, John chapter 12, in verse 23, it says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it di dies, it produces many seeds. Then he was using an agricultural picture that a seed is only a seed, but when it goes into the ground, it can become a plant that creates life for many seeds. And Jesus was telling him, that's me. I'm going to die. He forecast it very clearly. And then he says this, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. And my father will himself, excuse me, my father will honor the one who serves me. And then there's this cool moment that comes right after that, where it says, and then a voice, then Jesus said, Father, will I say, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said that an angel had spoken to him. 
And, and as I read that, I was struck reading through the stories about how many prophecies Jesus fulfilled, about what happened in all of these instances when he was on the cross, the, the curtain between the Holy of Holies and the temple was torn into a huge, thick fabric curtain. There was an earthquake. There was darkness. There was all of these signs, including this time when God speaks from heaven. So there was all these evidences, and so much so that the centurion himself said, "Ah, oh, surely this was the Son of God. So there was evidence galore, but there was very little belief. In fact, what happened is people respond in, I think, essentially the same categories that they do today. That there were some who saw Jesus' power and his miracles and his popularity. And you know what their conclusion was? We've got to kill this guy. What sense does that make? They actually said, we can't deny that he raised somebody from the dead, so our only solution, the only logical answer, is to try to kill him. He's becoming too powerful. And here's the point. It was because the story in their head was, if Jesus wins, I lose. If Jesus wins, if this insurrectionist rabbi gains a following, then he's going to cause an uprising and Rome is going to come in and squash us militarily. They're going to ruin the leadership that we as the Jewish leaders have. They're going to take our probably our fancy homes and our fat money bags. And isn't it interesting that they were right. If Jesus won, they were going to lose some things. But they chose because they wanted to have control and power to say, let's get rid of Jesus. In fact, the Pharisees, it says, said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. <laughs> it's not about where Jesus is going. It's about where we want, are going. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And so it says, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still, what's the next word there? Would not. Not could not. It's a choice. They would not believe in him. They made a choice to say no. We are not going to follow him. In fact, we are going to do everything we can to destroy what he is trying to do. And then in kind of a weird turn of affairs, because Lazarus had become such a central figure in this discussion, here's what their conclusion was. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and be believing in him. You see, once you start killing, there's just no good place to stop. And I'm thinking, this is... Think about it from Lazarus' point of view. I mean, what did he do, right? I died, got to go to heaven, got recalled, had to come back down to earth, and then I became the focus of this great debate. And some said, look at that, it's proof that Jesus is God. And others said, he's a problem, let's kill him. And, and Lazarus is going like, I came back to life and now I got a price on my head. And I thought last week, as Pastor Jeremy said, we're kind of like Lazarus. We have that wonderful role where God has brought us to life again and some people love it and it's proof that God's real and, and some people might flame you on Facebook if you put on that Jesus sign on your profile. Why? Because we're in that same place where God is working in our lives and some people love it and some people hate it because of where they are coming from. And so then we move to a very powerful scene. And I was thinking about this idea of Jesus being the king. And he came on the triumphal entry. And you know the group that did all the things you would do for a king? They put a royal robe on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They gave him a scepter in his hand. They knelt down in front of him. It was the Roman guards that after they had beat him with a cat of nine tails to where he was almost dead, that they brought him out and they mocked him and made fun of him. In fact, there was a, there's a square on the pavement there in Israel where you can see that they played a game called king for a day, that they would take a prisoner and they would say, you're the king, and they would do whatever he wanted at that point, and at the end of the day, they would kill him. 
and it was a sadistic kind of cruel humor that they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And there's a moment right after they've done this when Pilate, who was the Roman authority there, brings him out to the crowd to try at some point to release him because Pilate has become convinced that this guy doesn't deserve to die. Isn't it ironic that the idol-worshiping Roman leader seemed to have far more qualms about putting Jesus to death than the Jewish leaders? And he brings him out in this moment and he holds up a sign that they're going to put on the cross that said, Jesus, King of the Jews. And he says, here's the man. And basically he's asking the crowd, you decide. What do you want me to do with Jesus? And the Jews rejected that sign and they said, you should write on there, he said he was the king of the Jews. And I think Pilate had had it about up to here with them. And he said, what I've written, I've written. He is the king of the Jews. And in this mock worship, they knew a lot about who Jesus said he was. In fact, Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus said, I am. But my kingdom is not of this world. I'm a different kind of king. And you know, you and I stand and we look at that and we react to the, the physical agony that Jesus went through. Do you understand the spiritual agony of carrying your sin and my sin was far more gut-wrenching and terrifying than the physical part? And yet he went through that for our sake. Some tried to kill him. There's another group of responses to all of these evidences about Jesus. And there are people who just try to fit in. You see, I think that there were people who were there in the crowd on Palm Sunday that said, Hosanna, and I think a week later, there were some of those who were part of the same crowd that said, crucify him, because they had been manipulated by the authorities. Why? Because the goal of people who were in the crowd is to just fit in. I don't want to stick out. I don't want to just do with whatever's trending, whatever's cool, whatever's part of the culture, whatever other people are saying. I don't want to do anything that might invite some kind of reaction to me. And in fact, there was a very convicting phrase. As you look at John 12, he says, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, the Jewish leaders, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. That's convicting. Because you and I are very worried about what people would say of us. I think some of you wrestled with that even when we handed out these yard signs and said, put it in your sign and tell people that you're a follower of Jesus. And for some of you, you're thinking, Actually, I've been a Secret Service Christian for about the last 20 years. I didn't really want to make a thing of it. I don't, you know, and it's not like they're going to take you out and kill you. They might just unfriend you. But that line that says they love praise from men more than praise from God. You see, there are people in the crowd that do whatever the crowd does. Are there people like that today? Yeah, there are people that when they come to church, they talk good and they sing the songs and they say, yes, I'm a Christian. And when they hang out with the kids at school, when they hang out with the people at work, when they hang out with their friends, they take God's name in vain and they do things that are completely ungodly and, and they're chameleon. It's not that they have beliefs that anchor them. It's that they fit in with whoever they're with. And when they're with the church crowd, they talk like that. When they're with the Antichrist crowd, they talk like that. In fact, all of the disciples, when the pressure was on, bailed, didn't they? They were fearful of themselves. They were fearful of what people would say or what people would do to such a degree that Peter himself said, I don't even know the man. And in the final third denial, it says he called down curses. You see, there's a great temptation to have shallow faith that is only about who you're with. 
It's not about what's really changed in your life. It's not about who you are everywhere you are. It's about fitting in. And ironically, in a culture where you're not going to be persecuted for being a Christian, we are more afraid than the believers in China who may get persecuted. But things are sharpening up. The battle between those who are for Christ and those who are anti-Christ is sharpening up in our world and in our day. And you will have to choose more and more that fuzzy middle where we can say, I'm fine with God and I'm fine with the world is getting cut out. And they said, we believe, but we don't want to let anybody know. And you know, there's a world of difference between believing in God and believing God. To believe in God, to say, I know there's a God, I know He's powerful, I know Jesus was the Son of God, is the Son of God, I know He died, I know He was raised again. You can say, I believe all those things, but has it changed your life? Have you come to the place where that is the center of what you see the whole truth being? Is Jesus the only way to have a relationship with God? Is he the way, the truth, and the life? Because people don't care if you talk about Jesus. You just don't say he's the only way. And so many people are caught in that middle ground. And then there are some who believed and found life Some of them went through a time of denial and then came back to Christ. But I I put the word believed in there, and then later I thought, you know, I want to say that they worshipped and found life because they came not only to believe that Jesus really was who he said he was, they came to turn the control of their lives over to him. And you know, the story that just struck me as I read through it was the least likely person in all of Israel, I think, to become a follower of Jesus, and he was one of the thieves on the cross. It says that Jesus was crucified between two thieves, and the first thief was throwing the same kind of insults at Jesus that the rest of them were. And he says to Jesus, if you really are the Son of God, why don't you save yourself and us too? Can you imagine hanging on a cross with your life flowing out of you and you take the energy you have to insult somebody next to you that's on a cross also? I mean, that's, that's sick. And he makes that taunting statement and the other thief responds. The other criminal rebuked him and said, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what we deserve But this man has done nothing wrong. And then in an incredible moment of faith, and I want you to try to visualize this. Here he he is, he's dying as a thief on the cross. Jesus has been beaten terribly, he's dying, he's barely gasping to get enough air to say something. And in that moment, this is what the thief says. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Did Jesus look like a king at that point? I mean, he didn't look like he was going to live more than a few more hours, and he certainly didn't look like a king coming into his kingdom. Now, when he rode into the town and everybody was shouting Hosanna and all of the big fireworks were going off, you could say, yeah, now he looks like a king coming into his kingdom. But in this moment, and we don't know what the thief knew. I don't know if he had heard Jesus teach. I don't know if the only theological education he has was watching Jesus when he was getting nailed to the cross, say, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I don't know how much he knew, but it's not how much you know that causes you to believe. It's actually a gift from God to give you the faith to believe. And this man, in the middle of his agony, said, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And maybe you're saying, well, he was about to die. He had nothing left to lose. (laughs) Neither did the other guy. And there's a great phrase that says, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. That it doesn't depend on the evidence, it doesn't depend on how much you know, it depends on the state of your heart. And a famous preacher named Spurgeon said, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay, and the same gospel that melts some hearts to repentance hardens others into their sin. 
You see, it's the same truth. The question is, how do you respond to that? How does that affect you deeply and personally? And Jesus turned to him and said, truly I say today, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You think that happened? Say it like you mean it. You think that happened? Yes. Yeah. You see, it only took a scrap of faith, just a little bit. And instead of believing that for Jesus to win, I have to lose, you begin to say, yeah, Jesus said if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for me, you'll find not just your life, you'll find life eternal. And eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life starts the moment you trust your life to Christ and surrender. And you know, I think it's easy for us to think, if I were there, I would have done better than they do, than they did. There was a a master painter that took a time to go into a little Italian village and he was going to paint his masterpiece. And so he was working on a scene from the life of Christ. And it was the scene where Jesus is carrying his cross and the crowd around him is spitting at him and mocking him and laughing at him. And so he isolated himself in this little house in this village and he wouldn't let anybody see what he was doing. And he painted and he went day by day by day for several weeks. And finally the painting was finished. And so he put a cloth over it and he brought it out into the public square and he invited everybody who had been so curious about it for a long time to come and be the first ones to see this painting. And he whips off the fabric that was over the painting and there was that <gasps> at the beauty and the realism and the power of this painting at this moment when Christ was being mocked and then there started to be mutterings and I can't believe he did that and I can't believe that and people turned on their heels and began walking away because they realized that he had taken the faces of the local villagers and he had put them on the people in the crowd And everybody saw their own face mocking and rejecting the Christ. And you see, I think that we can tell ourselves, if I had more evidence, I would believe more. And I'm telling you that no, you wouldn't. That belief is a matter of the heart, not a matter of the head. And Christ really came, and there's lots of factual data, and he was fulfilling prophecy, and he did miracles, and all those things are true. And if there was nothing that's evidence, you watch the lives of the disciples who went from these scaredy cats who ran to powerful men who changed the world. I honestly think it's easier to believe now because we've seen all of the prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. We've watched, instead of the church being a band of frightened people on the day of Pentecost, it's, it's now a worldwide movement of millions of people who celebrate Easter. I think it's actually easier to believe. But you know what? We have exactly the same three groups. We have people who are anti-Christ. Mostly because... And I totally believe it's not always about knowing if Jesus is real. It's about I want control. I want to be my own life guide. And then there are people who fit in with the crowd. They do good when they're with people who love Jesus and they do terrible when they're with people who hate Jesus. They, they just flow with whatever is going on. And then there are people who say, I believe this is the truth, it's the only truth that's worth living for, and they find life eternal. And my question for you is, where are you in that story? And I'm going to hand off to our other campuses in Green and South Umqua, and you guys end the service there. And I want to ask you this question. Are you ready? Are you willing? Some of you maybe for the first time, some of you, maybe you've been a long ways away and you need to come back to put your total trust in Jesus. And we're going to end our service a little bit differently today. Uh, we do this sometimes, not often, but we're going to give an opportunity for you to respond. And what I'm going to ask you to do in just a few moments is if God is working in your life and you're at a point where you need to make a public commitment, then I'm going to invite you to come and to kneel up here and to let that be a public statement of I want to be a follower of Jesus and I don't care who knows. And for some of you, this may be the very first time you've actually entrusted your life to Christ and, and maybe you've grown up in the church and you know a lot of information or maybe this is your first time here. But I'll tell you, if God's at work, you'll feel the Spirit hammering at your heart saying, this, he's, 
He's talking to you. And maybe there's some of you that have been swept away in the crowd. You say, Paul, I really am a follower of Jesus, but I have not been living like it. I have been following whatever crowd comes by, and I, I drink what they drink, and I talk like they talk, and I live like they live, but inside I know it's not right. And for some of you, this needs to be a moment where you come back and you say, okay, God, thank you for being a forgiving God. And when the disciples forsook him and when they denied him and when they ran, he brought them back. And you know, the interesting part is you think, if I give up my life, I will be enslaved. And the truth is, if you give up your life, you will be free. Is that you'll have real life, life eternal, life with Jesus, life that changes everything. And so I'm going to pray, and I want you to ask God to soften your heart. And if you are needing to come up and just make a public declaration, I'm coming to Jesus or I'm coming back to Jesus, then the Spirit will tell you, and let me just say, just obey. It's a good place to start. Let me pray for us. Let's stand together and I'll pray. Father, I thank you for the stories that we have about what you said and did and how perfectly you fulfilled prophecy from the, the place you were born to the way that you died. And I thank you, God, for the evidence of the changed life of the disciples and for the evidence of other people that I see today who have clearly a life in them that's not natural. And Father, I pray right now that there would be people here that would say, I've been against Jesus or I've been just flowing with the crowd and today I'm ready to make a choice. I'm ready to put my control aside and surrender to Jesus and I want him to come into my life and to forgive my sins and to change me because I'm tired of messing up my life like I've been doing. God, I pray that without emotional manipulation but by the power of your spirit you would work in people's hearts right now and by your spirit you would say, come, 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 let me change your life. Let me give you life. And that, God, that there would be a heart of obedience, a heart of softness, a heart of believing. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.